Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the RHAP B&B for week six of Survivor 47. My name is Mike Bloom. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. We are here to mourn our merge. Drop the Tory. It's just a flat out merge at this point with extra steps, boot, uh, and a rather big one in the form of Rome as we talk about for the first time in quite a while, a flat-out burial of an episode in multiple ways. But there is a lot of stuff to get into. Liana, fortunately, not here, a la Genevieve. She is uh, on the sit-out bench doing a goofy laugh. Uh, that's a random three-second clip, by the way. I don't know if you guys noticed of, like, Genevieve laughing like goofy. Very strange. But regardless, Liana is out for this week. But I have two guests in her stead that are fantastic. Uh, coincidentally... There are two CBS or CBS base, I should say, reality shows on Wednesday nights that this week just had the game turn from team to individual. And these two guys were covering the other side of that coin in the form of the challenge as they do every week on the Free Agents podcast. Let me welcome in first Matt Ligori. Matt, how are you? So, so good. Sad uh, to not have Liana here with us today, of course. But uh, look, podcasting about Survivor, I hear, is uh, fun as hell. So excited to do it. And of Spend course, the, the one and only Brian Scally. Scally, how's it going? Hello, hello, Michael. I'm so good. I, like any other stay at, at a B&B, I am overpacked. I didn't sleep. I was so excited. So I'm um, glad to be here. <laughs> Listen, overpacking, uh, we might check your bag. So be sure to wash <laughs> anything covered in paint, Scally, immediately. But also be sure to leave all the paint just festooned around the immediate area for any visitors to come in as well no i don't clean up after myself so that is definitely for sure but i'll leave oh it my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well here we are gentlemen it has been an up and down five weeks and there's always a lot of what ifs when it comes to when the game becomes individual and all of these different tribal factions come together uh, but this time at least it was a rather unified stance with the exception of a few throwaway votes as Rome proved that the first impression he made on Lavo ends up being perhaps a bit duplicative in his first impression to Gata and Tuku as well. And as a result, he is our big merge boot here. Matt, I wish I had a camera on you live in the moment to get your reaction to the fall of Rome. But give me your overall thoughts on this episode and also how the season has been for you so far, because I know it's been a while since from the free agents perspective, you've uh, checked in on mm -hmm. survivor. Yeah. First of all, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you would need a camera. On <laughs> Please the fifth. The all you want. We I all know, know what you're talking about. Um, but look, so I think it's pretty universally agreed upon and hard to argue the character, the size of the character that Rome uh, was to the season of survivor. The, uh, you know, the love him or hate him type of feelings that you will get from a character like Rome. Um, and for me with a character like that, and probably for other people as well, um, the, the fun of that character is waiting for their downfall. It's certainly not the first, won't be the last in uh, a season like this or any season of any reality show. Um, so from the jump, having him be somebody who was kind of not, super on the ends of his tribe and then as the season uh you know obviously in the episode that asia ends up going um a bunch of people kind of come around him to to work with him because they have to because he's so protected with the idols and advantages that he had at that point um and then you, you see all the way along that like okay not everybody is loving working with him the teeny rome dynamic was interesting the genevieve dynamic with him was interesting because she was like well he's the closest person i have and somebody who i can trust at this point but i don't necessarily feel like i can uh work with him long term and so just to like see them all get to this stage of the game where obviously everybody's coming together. Mergatory is happening, whether it's the, the same mergatory we're used to or not. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, who are they going to throw out first? I mean, look, usually I, f I feel like usually uh, I think of it being the person from like the tribe that has the most numbers. So I was mm. kind of expecting somebody from the blue tribe to go, but when you really think about it and as you see the episode go on, you're like, Oh yeah, there's a whole tribe of people here that are more than happy to throw one of their own, you know, quote unquote uh, under the bus, let them go. And you know, the episode uh, presented to us by th the way that it was edited by Jeff's involvement in it, just from the very beginning of the episode being like, 
uh, Rome taking the previously on from Jeff and then later ending up in Jeff's seat. I was going to say, that's not the only thing he'll take from Jeff by the end of this episode. Right. And then having this whole moment of just like, this meant so much to me, just it, it felt like it completed his story within one 90 minute episode. And it was like a very nice conclusion. I don't know if he feels the same. It was a very nice conclusion from a fan's perspective of this story of this very big character. Yeah, Scally, give me your thoughts on Rome here, because he really was the episode, to Matt's point, and it's very unique. I feel like for an ensemble show like Survivor, it's very rare we get one entire 90-minute episode from one person's perspective, but especially in retrospect, given that, to his point, we start and end with two of the most meta moments in the show's history, does definitely display that, like, this was the Rome episode in its finality. Yeah, look, I love a big character. I love a messy character. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, in uh, terms that I'm sure Rome knows, like he got a bonus life. It was a little bit of a speed run here at the merge, but we got to see him in every situation. So I'm happy for that. I was like, curious to see how Rome interacts with every person in the cast. And we did get that. So I'm happy. Um, I will not lie the episodes that are just completely dunking on one person for 90 minutes i do enjoy quite a bit <laughs> i think they're, they're great very, i think they're so fun um i don't want them to overuse it in survivor i feel like they would yeah. become less special well that's but... the thing i think we've got like a mount rushmore now officially because i think the big the big three up to this point were roger sexton in the amazon uh chris noble and then drew christie is another big one like the rare non-merge one and so rome gets to be the teddy roosevelt to complete that set and i think i saw somewhere that he has the most confessionals uh of any i think it might have been like rob's fact check or someone that uh most confessionals ever for somebody who technically is pre-merge if you count this as pre-merge mergatory whatever so you know not a bad stat to hang your hat on on the way out yeah for sure. Can't believe that record was uh, previously Gina Cruz, apparently. <laughs> right? Yeah, Gina, you know, I mean, Gina went to tribal council in five out of the six episodes. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just, um, I, I could think of so many other people that I would have guessed before I ever got to Gina, but uh, shout out to her. I mean, that's <laughs> the thing is that uh, as much as Andy was talking about that people who finish pre-jury are only known as such, basically, in Survivor fan circles. Listen, I guess speaking from the perspective of somebody who just spent so much time over the course of this summer trying to discern who or may or may not get called back for a future season. I think as much as I love some of these people in the new era who were pre-jury, including on this very season, I think Rome kind of shoots to the top of that list uh, for many, many reasons. I mean, to your point, Scala, he really was speedrunning Survivor from yeah. the jump with him falling down a well, basically, to get a clue to an idol. And so... I think he gives production absolutely what they want. It's very clear in this episode that as much as uh, Rome might understandably claim that some of those sound bites were maybe fed through a little bit of a filter to make it seem like he had no idea what was going on. Like he provided those sounds in the beginning to allow the producers to use it. So he was able to just serve them up so much content week after week after week. And so Again, it's going to be a real uh, scrap to figure out who's going to be in this 50 cast. But if they decide to go very heavily new era and say like, okay, who's someone who didn't make the jury that could make it for a possible second chance? I, I think there's a chance we see the Roman Empire rise here on a possible season 50. Yeah, I think that you have production looking at like, okay, Rome runs a season. Imagine that season. Okay, Rome goes home in one episode. What a fun one episode. <laughs> like, That's it, exactly no it. Yeah. Rome was made to be in the final five of Survivor Game Changers, like the first version of it. Like, <laughs> he would just fit in so well somewhere in that group um, and, and make it to the end. I, I don't know. Um, I do want to say you brought up Mike uh, Andy's comment about, you know, your pre-merge status defines your legacy in Survivor. I hope that there is a couple more uh, pre-merge people in season 50 or just, I don't know, in some returning season going forward because there are so many fun characters. So many of them have, you know, gone on to uh, be such a big presence in the community within RHAP, within just like in general, within, you know, the spaces that we exist in um, that uh, there's so many of them I'd love to see back. And I, I feel like a lot of them are going to need a little bit of a, a boost after Andy's comments there. Yeah, that's the thing is that, I don't know, I, it was the most surprising coming from Andy, who 
besides Teeny, is probably like the most knowledgeable about the ins and outs of the Survivor fan community because I would say, if anything, the pre mergers in very specific circles are held in even higher regard than some of the most famous people to make the merge. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would imagine, and I haven't, you know, been through this experience myself to say so, but I would imagine that when you end up in this pre-merge spot, probably takes a little a little bit of a, of time to kind of accept that this has been your fate. Uh, obviously, you want to go a lot further. So, again, it's just like you probably get over that at a certain point in some capacity, and then you go watch Andy at Tribal Council be like, screw these people, sucks to be them, as he uh, gets two <laughs> votes and almost, uh, you know, goes home as a backup vote, which uh, very glad he did not. That's my king. Uh, uh, but it was close. Could have been. Yeah. And I mean, okay, yeah, Survivor Super fans are only going to remember like the pre mergers. Like, okay, let's go quiz a casual on like anyone from Survivor 42. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Again, I, yeah, I think well, it'll be interesting to see like uh, what the, the mental cachet is on someone like Rome even a few seasons later, but still an incredibly unique persona up until the time when his torch was snubbed. So we, we got to get into a few beats here. I mean, let's talk about the thing that arguably sinks him from the jump in this episode. And it is really interesting in that from the Lavo perspective, it was certainly like death by a thousand cuts, right? That from what we saw last episode, even his closest ally is like, he is doing too much sketchy shit right now. He's throwing me under the bus to Saul. I don't know if I could trust him necessarily. I've compared it to before. He's that tiger on the leash that you try to domesticate, but like you'll inevitably get scratched. And so you think, okay, a new opportunity, new group of people. And from our perspective, it seems like that goodwill is undone over the course of one morning. And it riles up, again, from our perspective, one of the most mild-mannered contestants we have had in years. Scally, give me your perspective on everything that happened with Rome and Kyle and also maybe some perspective on uh, some stuff that has been brought to light after the fact. Uh, it's wild. I mean, as Rome said, so much of just like that initial vote is someone's name gets brought up and don't push too hard in a different direction. Just let it happen. It's fine. You're going to be safe. And Unfortunately for Rome, that name was his. I think had he not played the pre-merge in the way that he did, maybe he would be given the benefit of the doubt in certain situations. But instead, everyone had an entire, like, uh, you know, 13 reasons why they should not trust <laughs> Rome. <laughs> like, it's that smile. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you know, they had all of the reasons in the world of like, no, 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 no we have to fact check every single thing. So even if Rome is completely telling the truth, then <laughs> yeah, maybe we should probably still trust the other person. Yeah, the, uh, the the way that he comes in so hot by, you know, having this whole plan in his head of uh, let me take what Kyle says and run with it and run back to everybody. It's like, OK, this is this is fun if it were to work um, and to see like Kyle's head spinning later on, if it had if it had worked, I, I want to say like if Tiana and uh, whoever had like uh, actually believed that Kyle was saying all of these things and wanted them out of the game. And it wasn't just this casual conversation. And then Kyle eventually gets to tell them, you know, Rome was the one that actually threw that all out there. I was just kind of nodding and agreeing. Um, it would have been, it would have been interesting, but I mean, this is not the kind of gameplay as we uh, can all imagine, or as we all know from watching many seasons of the show uh, from watching Rome attempted here, that is going to get you too far, uh, especially this early on when everybody comes together, people are looking for a reason to single somebody out. And uh, he, you know, gave lots of reasons to lots of people yeah and i think it really depends on the timbre of the group because i would imagine from rome's perspective he's like look what gabler did with ellie right like he was the one that really threw this name out and led the charge and a lot of people were like all right i'll just go with the first name given as long as it's not me i just need to survive and ellie was voted out i mean there's a few reasons why this didn't work one is i think because of what we'll talk about with the the unmergatory the fact that it's not okay, for the six people on the bottom, like you just have to go with any name to survive. Like there is a little bit more of a picking and choosing of, okay, well, basically everyone except Kyle is vulnerable. So I can really, uh, you know, serve up the target that I want rather than the one that is kind of given to me. And the second, again, it comes with every season is uh, you can make the same move in back-to-back -back instances, but it always depends on the people that you are with. And Listen, I don't think any of us expected Kyle to go from a G movie to going like the hard R with the fuck Rome and he's a dick, like absolute heel turn. But 
at the same time, like it, it's interesting in that if Rome had maybe thrown out like Saul's name first, that maybe would have done a little bit better. Because again, we see with Gabler and Ellie, right? Like it's not like Gabler sits down at the merge feast and says, yeah, you know what? We need to go for Dwight right now. Like he was trying to, Rome was trying to take a shot at someone else in another tribe, trying to bank off of these first impressions of tribal dynamics mm -hmm. from not being a part of that group. And I do think that's a bit of a fundamental mistake because yeah, the two coups have obviously a much closer relationship that they will immediately go to each other and start comparing notes. Yeah. And I think it's also <laughs> that he tried to, and I mean, you know, was semi-accurately reporting, at least in some cases, uh, that Kyle said things about every single person on the tribe, and you're bound to hit one person who's not going to believe you and start funneling that back to Kyle. Whereas if he had just gone and been like, by the way, Sam, like he wants to target you next. I think that that could have had a lot higher of a success, success, success rate. Go to the Yellow Tribe. Like, all right, it's us two. We're working together. I think that could have been a lot more of a successful play, but I think he shot too big. I agree. I mean, I think yeah. definitely going to the Yellow Tribe, going to Sam in particular would have been like a great way to go. Um, so I think maybe it just does come down to kind of like a misread on who the people, the proper people were that could have been receptive to, receptive to a plan like that. Um, the Yellow Tribe obviously coming fresh off of a tribal council um, very recently, you know, it feels like there could be room to actually explore there um, what's going on rather than the Blue Tribe who has not been to tribal council and you would imagine has been bonding since they voted out TK a year ago yeah you never know though i mean i think there's that adage right about like if you don't go to tribal for a while or if you don't go to tribal at all that things like immediately splinter that's what happened with nami of course as recent as last season but tuku is not nami again it seemed like now what i will say is it seemed initially like rome did go to the right person in sue and was like sue I'm going to give you another reason to hate this guy, Kyle. And it seemed like initially Sue was biting. I think just the trouble was, yeah, to your point, he almost, uh, ironically enough for the fishermen of the tribe, cast too wide of a net, tried to like go to too many people and say too many different things. And yeah, I, I do try to go back and see like, was how, how much was he twisting Kyle's words? I think the only thing that I really saw was that he seemed to like kind of be leading Kyle along to say Tiana's name. By being like, oh, who's the biggest threat? And Kyle says, oh, yeah, I think Sam is running things. He's just like, well, well what about women? What do you right. think about Tiana? Like, He's like, what about Tiana? It's like, oh, uh, yeah, Tiana could win. And he's like, ah, gotcha. Gotcha. You said the thing I wanted you to say. Yeah, which is very Tony and LJ, right? Of like, I need you to say the actual thing so I have a reason to be able to go to people. Because Survivor is not a game about lying. We are all recorded. We can all go to Video Village <laughs> and watch it to make sure that Kyle said what he actually said. Mm -hmm. yeah it's surprising that rome i mean at least on camera doesn't have more proactive lying in his arsenal i would assume that you know who, why does he need to entrap kyle why not just go ahead and say he said all of this and worse <laughs> i'm i'm surprised actually that i know that rome the games that he usually commentates on are uh you know obviously a more of like a competitive variety like a rocket league like a Fortnite. but i'm kind of surprised he doesn't have any at least recorded footage of him playing some of these social strategy games like in among us like a goose goose duck because again given the way he plays survivor it would be absolute madness from the jump mm -hmm. i did want to go back to you we were talking about how he goes to sue uh as if as if sue doesn't have her own problems here that she's dealing with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to talk about this it's just it's what just very hell, funny sue? because yeah just because like i can't imagine having a single rational conversation with sue at the moment because she is just waiting for the sirens to get closer and closer waiting for the cop cars to pull up and and take her in uh so i can't imagine anything being said to her at any point right now is process being processed normally <laughs> Yeah, we, we need to talk about this because as, as much fun as we thought the like, oh no, the paint got splattered everywhere. I think we thought that the body was pretty well clear under the floorboards. And basically these new people moved into the house and just saw a hand sticking mm -hmm. up from the ground. This is... And it didn't oh, take oh, much for them to just pull the hand out yeah. and say strings. Uh, it's, it's, pottery, a, it's, like. a, it's an, a lovingly abhorrent cover job. And the thing that I'm also obsessed with Scally is the fact that again, if we are to take the episodes edit as gospel, this happened days ago and it still hasn't <laughs> been covered up more than just burying the pot, like one inch under the sand. 
that's my favorite part is that Sue was so sure they would look through her bag and not that they would see anything else, apparently, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> like anything in plain sight, eh, that's fine. But her bag, that is where we really got to worry about. I just, I don't know how you don't go to like to the water well and like at least do like a little inspection. I understand she was up against time when everyone came there, but this is quite some time Sue had to clean up. I, yeah. I know you guys obviously talked about this when it happened, Mike, but just like, I can't even imagine like what I would do in a moment like that. It's not, it just feels completely impossible to hide. Like, I don't know, maybe you just have to make up some other excuse as to why a thing dropped of paint, because it's just, if you're, you have to spend the whole day there, just cleaning it, covering it up, getting it off your hands, obviously not successfully. She gets it on her chin and it stays there. Um, and the fact that, you know, Caroline sees, okay, great. Like we're working together and Caroline's going to come to her and be like, look, I know you have it. And she's like, what? She's like, no, I know you have it and it's okay. I, I, I'm so proud of you. Uh, but Tiana seems to not have that same level of, or she seems to not, Sue seems to not have that same level of trust in Tiana. So somewhere along the way, this needed to be, uh, to come out, to come to light or to be completely buried. And again, it was not buried well enough. Well, I think also, again, this is definitely reverse engineering. So she shouldn't have expected this like advantage hunt as soon as they hit feet on the new beach but i mean people were saying after the fact like oh genevieve found the advantage that the red paint had to do with it at all this could have been the perfect out right like maybe you dig out the pot and you like say oh my god look at all this red paint looks like somebody broke it to get something for an advantage we should hunt out to see who who got the advantage if, if sue pulled it out herself and she was the one uh making it seem like she found it in front of listen everybody, on these murder mysteries nobody suspects the person that finds the victim no you report <laughs> the body only in half the time in goose goose duck you get exactly. uh, actually called out for it Hmm, I don't know. I think Doth might protest too much at that point. I'm wondering on <laughs> Sue's acting skills, the like, which one of us definitely found this thing here? <laughs> yeah, it's been very much giving uh, Tim Robinson and the hot dog yep. suit. We're all trying to find the guy who did this. I also loved random throwaway moment as well. And maybe another reason why Sue was uh, a little distracted by the cover up efforts, because she is also working on her own big lie of when Saul's like, you're 45, I'm 43. We're really looking good. great right now. <laughs> Honestly, iconic. If I was lying to be 15 years younger than I was, and Which someone you told do. me I still looked amazing for that age, <laughs> uh, down. <laughs> Scally regularly goes to like 22-year-olds, and he's like, we just look so good for our look, age of 23 just, years old. <laughs> we have so much in common. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just got, I just got ID'd. <laughs> Can you believe it? They just, they asked for my ID. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean at least like the good thing about maybe saul would be the only one to like interrogate her about uh age bracket specific things right it's giving very much the circle to me of when like the older people play the much younger people and they're like what does this thing mean uh luckily i don't think sue is going to necessarily fall victim to that again she has much, much bigger fish to fry in the yeah. immediate future. It would have been great to get like a, a Saul confessional right after that, just looking straight at the camera saying she is not 45. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, like he very clearly seemed to pick up on that. And it's, you know, it's been well discussed of like, okay, if somebody lies to you about their age, great. Like you'll find out what their age is later. Who cares? Um, but like just him saying that to her was funny, but it would have been even funnier to just get it straight to our face. Like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> nice try. Yeah. And then the one thing I will say, and I agree, I was largely entertained by just the Rome downfall of it all. There's just so many good sound bites from, you know, him saying like, I was able to get 13 people to vote my way. I guess that shows the caliber of player I am, which is just one of the most objectively fantastic, ironic statements I have heard out of Survivor ever. Like, good God, the number of ways it can be used to him sitting on the stump. But I think it does unfortunately come at the cost of like, actually getting to see these cross-tribal interactions that we kind of have been hoping for. I mean, now that we're moving into it next week, uh, I would imagine that, you know, we're actually going to see it ferment now that the Rome is out of the picture. But we'll have to wait a little bit of a week on that fan fiction. But let's talk about perhaps a piece of fan fiction that got willed into reality. Because I think almost from the beginning, people were like, why are we doing this mergatory thing? Why are we having half of the possible group safe? Why are they determining it in like a challenge by random draw? And Survivor Production, whether they heard us or purely coincidence, said, all right, we're going to make this a normal merge, but not say it's a normal merge. It's mergatory 
in name only. Was this a welcome return to form for you guys? Sure. (laughs) Definitely for me. Um, I feel like it's production saying this isn't a normal merge is giving Sue saying she's 45. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like, no, 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 it's not exactly what you think it is. Um, They are, you know, doing a lot of work to try to convince us, but I'll take it. I mean, calling it a twist that only one person is safe. Like, sure. As if that's not normal and standard. Um, But whatever they have to lie to themselves to us about, that's fine. I think it is much more interesting this way. Now, obviously, it does go the way of someone in the group that would have otherwise been vulnerable. Uh, Also, going home, I think it is still a pretty straightforward boot. I think in many cases, this, like, (laughs) opens up the gameplay in a much better way. So I like this as a... (laughs) format much better clearly very much so yeah i would have uh been happy with this format going back to normal years ago um it's one of the you know modern era changes that they made that it felt like we didn't really need to do uh more than once if we even needed to do it once and i think that you know we've seen as the seasons have gone on kind of chipping away at some of those things that we've uh invented for the new era or tried to make happen in the new era that it's like like we'll go back to a little bit of just what survivor is um so i'm glad to see this kind of go uh by the wayside for now i don't know if it'll be the same in 48 or not but i feel like the experiment was pretty good here you know on one hand the person who does go home is somebody who was on the losing side of things anyway so he still would have been eligible but to not be able to have had like this episode should be to production the example of if you had rome safe if rome happened to be on the winning team and those six people were safe here and you didn't get to have this downfall like masterful episode that you produced onto my television screen on wednesday night that like why are you why are you trying to save that from yourself just to have okay six what's the point what are we doing Yeah, I mean, to their point about, oh, it's a twist in Mergatory. I know a lot of people raise an understandable stink of like, this is not a twist if it's just going back to the way things were. I would more so say, let's just change the language a little bit. We'll call it an untwist, right? That Mergatory twisted up the way that we normally start the individual game. And this was just kind of untwisting it. Uh, Like you're you're tensing it up, you're twisting, 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 and then you finally let it go in the rubber band spins so much like i would call like if we did a vote at the final four now that would not be a twist it would be an untwist of just going back to the way that things were but yeah to your point matt i think it just goes to show why this format was so successful the first 40 seasons of the show it's like just (laughs) you rely on the people to make the entertainment happen and they did in a major way now maybe on the one hand to your point it could be something of like well, we wouldn't get this Rome boot episode, but Rome would last longer and he's absolute television gold. But again, we got so much out of Rome packed in these six episodes that I did not necessarily feel hungry by the end of it. And also getting to see one of the reasons why he ends up failing and not getting this chance at individual immunity is because, once again, he puts himself in that hero role next to Gabe and it is just absolute disaster, right? It is Rome in a nutshell where... The two of them are not communicating. They're just jerking the handles up and down wildly and the balls jumping around all over the place. It really is emblematic of, I think, the way Rome was perceived in the game. Yeah, careful, Mike. Rome is going to say that you were very mean to him. But, uh, like, yeah, the ask to switch out seemed pretty gentle from my perspective. Um, We've seen Rome kind of take this hero spot, whether it be on a puzzle or on a maze or et cetera, a couple times now and have not super successful outcomes. So very entertaining, but I don't even believe they were allowed to switch out here. I I think that at a certain point, you've seen a couple of these not go so well. Maybe we volunteer instead, but uh, not ideal. (laughs) I mean, it goes to the exact same way that he was approaching the gameplay itself here of just like, let me, let me, you know, head on, let me take this head on and, um, you know, have full control of both what's happening within my game, within the challenge and, you know, hope for the best. Um, I'm glad that by the way, we got the, you know, change in format, the untwist as you will. Uh, but it still took so much time at the episode, uh, to have to do two challenges back to back. I know sometimes we have a reward challenge anyway, but just to have the continuous length of one challenge into the next and, you know, we got some great memes out of it with Genevieve sitting alongside everybody else yes. in the mud. Those were great, <laughs> uh, great tweets, Brian, Rob, but, uh, you know, still a little too long. Yeah. I mean, just give them the buffs. Like, come on. We're basically there anyway. Earn the merge. They've earned it by being here for 12 days. 
Give them all a feast. Give them all it's the like, buffs. Right now, it's just um, it's mergatory again, as I said, in name only. It's a formality. Having, having buffless people walk around a Survivor Beach is not what you know was intended uh, many many years ago when this show was created. They're, they they need to be buffed. What did you think about the <laughs> minute one advantage hunt? Did it move the needle at all for you one way or the other? I love that they all rejected it. <laughs> I love that so much. I love when Survivor <laughs> tries to force a twist on people and they say, oh. no, we know what's actually better for us. And right now, socializing is a lot more important than a advantage I'm probably not going to find for one single challenge. Can I tell you the moment of the episode for me? It was when Tiana found the sign before everybody else and she yells back, Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm like, what? I, I, <laughs> hey, I everyone, I, come on over. No, Look I know. I side. think that is the, that is the most like <laughs> neutral thing you could possibly say, considering that like I don't think she even exchanged words with these people. They hopped off the boat, and she's like, okay, do I want to be too demanding at right. this point? Like, do I, I don't want to say like, hey, everybody, stop what you're doing and come over here. Then I'll be seen as too domineering. So let me just be like. Let me nudge them a little bit. Excuse me. It was me. the most polite excitement <laughs> to see a Survivor Clue sign something like that that I've ever seen. So shout out to Tiana there. Um, but yeah, uh, when they all decide that they're not going to do it, very funny. Um, Andy's talking about, you know, we all want to get to know each other. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, that's that's fine. This advantage is probably not worthwhile. Um, and, you know, when you do actually go out and fight for it like Genevieve does and, and you find it, great. But, but is she rewarded, fighting for kinda. it? Even she's like, oh, God, I have to go on the I know water. She was so miserable having to go get <laughs> it and that was even funnier but when they then later have to go tell jeff what happened and have like disappointed dad talking to them about like you guys really just don't like my advantage and the amulet you don't like that either you don't like any of my stuff i give this stuff to you this is for you uh i love it so so much because yeah to your point about like the dad metaphor it's like the dad went to like a pottery class and was like look at this great stuff i'm making everybody they're like yeah gee dad it's great i don't need an ashtray necessarily mm -hmm. i vape now and it's like <laughs> you could hear his heart shatter a little bit he is just so incredulous at tribal council to your point not only about yeah we like looked for two minutes and then we decided that we should just like sit down and meet each other and then also yeah the fact that like here are these big cross tribal secret amulets Nope, everyone knows about them and they're going to be played uselessly at this tribal council. Sorry, Jeff, we're 0 for yep. 3 in this. Yeah, <sighs> Dad, no one uses amulets anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> very Come much. Come on, that they'll energy. give you Riz. <laughs> I wrote about them on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing with the amulets is, again, I think they're a really interesting idea. And we saw them in like 42 and 45 a little bit about how it did allow them to eventually all turn on each other. I think the bad thing about it, and again, what worked really well in 42, but not in 45 and 47, is you can't give them away on a journey. Because the meta on the journey now is that you go there, you go to this little sandbar, you talk with people, and you have to go back and tell some sort of story to everybody. And so it incentivized all these people to be like, yep, this is what I have. Because also, if you lie about it, there's a very good chance the other two didn't. And so then the notes are immediately going to be yeah. compared and you're going to end up in the line of fire. So it's something that I think should be, in its best usage, something that's secret, right? This cabal of three people kind of working together. But almost every time it is played out, because the nature of the information is so public, it basically ends up just kind of getting wasted. If yeah. I'm Jeff, I'm just telling production, go pull every idol out there, every advantage still on the beaches, go take them back. These ungrateful little uh, <laughs> players don't want any of our toys and they can go play on their own. Sounds like a dream. <laughs> it, <does. laughs> it sounds like what Survivor 45, one of those seasons yeah. recently, just no idols. 46. Look, yeah, exactly. 46. For me, like you, Mike, you say the idea of the untwist. If that's why we have to sell it, like, ooh, the twist of the season, you know, the new era really was a reset, and the twist is now all the jury members get to stand up and ask their own question at final tribal council. <laughs> like, sure, whatever you have to tell them, I'm down. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, it, you know, I imagine now we're going to get at least an idol hidden at the merge. Now maybe something else in lieu of, like, the amulets all being utilized here. I mean... It was a pretty wild tribal council because then Jeff follows that up with, oh, you think it's so easy to come up with these things? Well, why don't you step up and do it yourself? And look, 
I love me some some Chrissy Hoffbeck. I know that uh, she and some other players were uh, a little peeved at the idea that the line was being crossed, basically, that they stepped up to the altar and uh, sat at the lectern a little bit. Maybe it's because I'm part of, you know, the Fun and Games podcast on RHAP. To me, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's a, it's a fun site. It makes for a fun photo to see Rome sitting there, but I don't think this is something as, like, sacred as Jeff Stump filled with ass sweat for the past <laughs> 10 years that they've been in Fiji. Yeah. It's not that much of a profound image that the entire, like, guise of the game is broken. Just just realized you said Jeff Probst's ass sweat. Um, uh, Don't worry, but... I'm sitting on that Twitter handle. That was a <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it would be one thing if, like, suppose Rome had sat out of a challenge and he was literally allowed to commentate in Jeff's role in the challenge. Like, maybe that's a little too much because then you're going to get, like, future players that, like, want to do the same and just, like, have that moment for themselves that are probably going to be denied that because it was supposed to just be a one-time special thing. But this was, like, I'm, I'm surprised this didn't happen earlier. And I know that Rob has been talking about, you know, Jeff has tried this a couple times uh, to get somebody else to take the bait. Uh, so I guess he has kind of had this idea in mind for a little while longer. But, um, you know, it was going to happen sooner or later. And if Survivor goes on for years, then, okay, 47 is when it finally happened. And I, I don't see it happening too often in the future yeah i'm not so precious about stuff like this like eh, yeah. whatever it was funny it was a moment uh people are talking about it and especially if and when jeff like knows that rome is going home like eh, like let him make a big show of it like it, it adds to the edit of the episode that's fine with me is this going to be like the new getting up and talking during tribal council like like when somebody has a thing to say they're gonna say jeff may i may i have the chair uh, excuse me Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that'd be interesting. And then maybe maybe the two sides just sort of converge until it eventually becomes like Jeff sitting alone. Like, I don't know if, if you guys have ever had that professor in college who like doesn't necessarily stand in front of the class or they do the seating arrangement where everyone's in a circle. So it's mm -hmm. like, listen, we're all free thinkers here. I'm on the same level as you all. So let's have a discussion. The day Maybe they we'll enclose tribal council into a circle. <laughs> I don't know what we're no. going to have to talk about at that point. That is, I mean, look, after Survivor, a lot of them probably end up sitting in a circle to talk about what happened. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't think that we need that out there in, in tribal council. Jeff is already talking about like, wow, I can see things out there that I couldn't normally see because tribal council is so well lit today. Um, I think we need to focus <laughs> still on the players in front of us. Yeah, I mean, I know the tribal council goes on for a while, but does Jeff does Jeff need a standing desk? Does he need sort of like because I would imagine as well when he was standing, I wonder if he sort of felt in a different position, not from a lighting perspective, but even like, oh, I see you all a bit differently now, and you all see me a bit differently. Mm -hmm. mm. They should all stand the whole time. Oops, all standing. <laughs> I Honestly, mean, would be more comfortable than those schools, I'm sure. I don't know. I mean, those these people are dog tired. Like, imagine if they had to stand for an hour and a half. They'd be like, Jeff, uh, uh, yes, no, uh, none of the above. Can we get to voting now? Those are all the answers to your questions. I'm not going to say anything. I just want to vote and go home, please. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, oh, but, like, then he could, like, do the Big Brother key wheel and tell them to sit down once they're safe when he's reading the votes. He's like, zero votes, Ooh. Kyle. Zero votes, uh, <laughs> whoever. <laughs> and then they just <laughs> pop down until somebody is left standing and then they go. Oh, or now Jeff, we're really just, reinventing the game. Or Jeff, like they all stand for the question and answer. And then when they get up to vote, they then go individually to sit down. They sit and down, then, yes. <laughs> and then like the traders, Jeff will walk behind their backs and just tap the person on the shoulder. As they're <laughs> yeah. going. And then you open your eyes and you're like, Rome? Rome's gone. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Do, do like a heads up, seven up. I'm like, <laughs> okay, you have to sneak out very quietly as you get your torch stuff. <laughs> or Annika, she would not be able to have said a word no. if she said... <laughs> Yeah, ruin that drive. Now I'm out. Really On yeah. that alone, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. It does prevent like the big reactions. Uh, the big, the, or even or like, they just have to be quiet. They have to be like, which one? You did what? Who, what? <laughs> Jeff, can you give me a hug? Right. <laughs> like tap him on the shoulder and just like pull him in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's keep talking about Rome, much like the episode did, because Leon and I each wrote preseason predictions for Ooh. how we thought that Rome would do. And Rome from the beginning was a big character. This was a guy who watched every single season of Survivor in a three-month period last year. Suffice it to say, he was coming in hard with that energy from my first interview with him, and it carried over 
into his exit press as well. This guy was nonstop. So how did we think he would do? I will start with Liana, who in absentia did send in her predictions. So I will try my best to provide a neutral tone to it for your <laughs> gentleman's judgment here. Liana had Rome making the jury. She said that Rome's big personality kept him from being in the in-group on Lavo, but his challenge strength kept him from being voted out pre-merge. In the last journey of the pre-jury, Rome earn, earns himself an idol that was good for three tribal councils, which, like Yule's super idol, keeps him safe without his social game needing to do much work. As soon as that idol expires, Rome falls in a blind side due to his overconfidence. Rome also pulls out his Jeff impression a few too many times, and we slash the castaways start to be annoyed by it. His closest ally was Andy, and his enemy was Gabe. Uh, yes, I, I mean, maybe a lot of this got left on the kite room floor. Only one instance of the Jeff impression, in my opinion, and it really yeah. came at the most appropriate time when he sat in his chair. Look, we had the Jeff impression. He did have an idol. I don't know about the challenge prowess, um, but otherwise, <laughs> there was a little bit of that, that on the season. Mm -hmm. So, uh, after a bit of a divergence last week, Leon and I are both simpatico once more. We have converged. I also had Rome making the jury. I said, immediately hitting the beach, Rome tries to channel the guy that made him fall in love with Survivor in Ozzy. He steps up as the tribe provider, though his high level of energy wears thin after a while. But Rome didn't just fall out of the coconut tree, though he almost does at one point. His constant trips for food and firewood mask his ferocious idol hunting. As a result, he's able to find Lavo's idol, which he ends up wasting pre-merge. While Rome's excitable personality endears him to the majority initially, his eagerness to go on journeys and have cross-tribal relations unnerves some of his allies. That's only amplified when the merge hits. As the jury starts, the Lavo Tories seem primed to waste the competition. But when Rome tells Sue about wanting to target Saul eventually, she spreads that info back to the other party. As a result, Saul flips on his tribe, leading to the sudden but devastating fall from Rome in one clear message, game over. His closest allies were Asia and Teeny, and his enemy was Saul. Oh, I, I wish a mix of all of that was true of what you said and what she said. I wish his closest ally was Asia uh, for a time being. And uh, I wish his enemy was Gabe because uh, maybe other enemies wouldn't have gone at a certain point. Uh, oh, that's a lot to chew on. Um, I feel like you were very close in uh, uh, the latter half of that talking about that he was well what about him and sue and saul I was like yeah, that he, that that he, that he like is flapping his gums because he's so overconfident he's like yeah don't worry we're gonna get rid of saul eventually like the lavos are not gonna go to the final four together and then sue is just gonna yeah. go over to saul and spread that information he did you know quote unquote waste an idol pre-merge he did show up insisting on being the provider i don't know how well it went but i guess you know lost energy maybe a little quicker uh than thought um closest ally being asia might be a big disqualifier um, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair uh liana said his closest ally was andy so <laughs> yeah <laughs> closest next closest vote getter was andy yeah yeah first. look at this uh liana and i Something. both had rome the rhap sympathizer in the preseason <laughs> also why do you why do you both think that he's like loving the journeys that he wants to you know did he say in preseason that he was dying to go on journeys i mean he just seemed to have that energy of like i'm gonna take every opportunity given that he did mm -hmm. seem like the guy that would say oh can i do this one and there also seemed to be people like Keyshawn on his tribe that were like i absolutely do not want to go on any of these things that he's like much like we saw from a bit of their time together like Keyshawn was more than happy to give rome the shovel to bury himself right oh it's interesting you guys are very simpatico again like you said it's very much aligned i'm having a tough call between the two can you do you still have liana's up what's I the do. like the first like line or two again Rome's big personality kept him from being in the in-group on Lavo, but his challenge strength kept him from being voted out pre-merge. Challenge strength. I mean, he's not in the top half of, I think, who kept them in the challenge strength. <laughs> I think his challenge <laughs> strength actively made them lose a lot of challenges when it comes to the puzzles. So I, I did feel like I had something in the early portion of that that made me feel like it wasn't the answer. But again, Mike also has Roman Asia as uh, solid allies. I do feel like I'm leaning towards Mike's, though. Uh, I... The overall. 
can come in alignment but it's like truly by a hair yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's so uh, close yeah uh we, we're sort of hurting at this point with our predictions so i'm more than happy to take uh the edge right now while liana will stew for another week before she trounces me in next week prediction or probably not because guess what uh, we're probably gonna say the exact yep, same thing she wasn't gonna hear to defend herself this week <laughs> ah you know what that's what happens um but yeah any any final thoughts on rome because again such a, a monumental character. I would say one of the most unique characters we have had in some time. Any any way we want to send him off besides, again, the hour and a half episode that already did send him off? I feel like these aren't so final thoughts on Rome. I think we'll see him at some point again. Um, Rome was a fun character, I think got to probably live a little past his expiration date in what could have very easily been a pre-burge boot. And so I had a lot of fun. I think that I am like a little sad to lose the character, but also interested what the show looks like with like the absence of Rome. Yeah. Um, I feel like I can agree that I do want to see more Rome and that is me saying, I want to see Ponderosa videos, uh, bring those back to untwist it. Show me the Ponderosa videos. Um, I want to see the group dynamic already before Rome even was a part of that group. Uh, but especially once Rome, uh, walks in. That's the thing is as much as a lot of us were disappointed to see John Lovett go first, like I cannot wait for that NDA to expire and for John to give like the full dossier as to what that pre-merge group was like. And I imagine if we keep going with the jury of eight, we're going to have another person joining it as well, which might shake things up even more. If yeah. like Genevieve gets voted out, like imagine as chaotic as Lava was having four of them in the pre-merge group. Like we've heard little drips and drabs from what Keyshawn has said, from what Rome has said, but it's it's it must have just been absolute fireworks until they were all properly dismissed to go back home. Yeah, look, at this point, I feel like the remaining Lavo members, there's a lot of intrigue for all three of them. Genevieve has really awoken in the past couple of weeks, and people are excited of what she she might do. Saul's been great, you know, looking for uh, the soldiers to make their way all the way to the end and, and watch him, you know, march through the season. Um, and Teeny has, you know, first of all, what a fun episode for Teeny. Yeah. Uh, getting the drinks in at the, uh, <laughs> at the reward. <laughs> um, yeah, and I feel like they've been, uh, you know, a, a really fun strategic presence to watch through uh, the beginning of the season. And seeing how they interacted with a bunch of people uh, during the last reward challenge that a couple people came together for. So with all three of them, now that Rome is out of the way and they don't feel like they have to watch an extra person uh, rather than, you know, just being able to work with people that they want to work with, I feel like um, it's going to be fun. So I'm just saying, I hope, I, I don't want it to be one of these three that goes next. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting because it seems like certainly we are being led down the path of Andy eventually turning upon his uh, tribal saviors in the form of Sam and Sierra. You know, he ends up being the decoy vote without knowing it. We did not see this, but there's a secret scene of the schoolyard pick and Andy is not chosen. Like he is given a team by default, but he's trying to play this up, right? It's like, they think I'm this wounded bird a la gay, but I'm a wounded snake. Where, yeah, maybe I'm I'm in a little bit of a lower standing than you may think. But, like, once you get me in a good enough position, I'm going to bite you. You can take care of me all you want to, but I am a snake at the end of the day. So I would imagine that's where we're going next, pending any sort of twist that might be happening. I think the Lavo heat might die down now that, like, these three pretty much all get along with each other. They're not going to be sort of saddled with a bit more of a social burden in the form of Rome. And... There's plenty of cracks on Tuku that did not need to be manufactured by Rome that I think could also lead to them striking at each other as well. For sure. So, it'll All be right. fun. Let's move into our game this week. Now, gentlemen, spooky season is on the horizon here, and we have decided to honor it in a, a little bit of a takeoff on something that the two of you like to do. Of course, if you're a patron, of free agents first off become one because they got a lot of great exclusive shit and one of them being a weekly patron pod and one of the things you guys do is you look at uh online surveys about i wouldn't say like the favorability ratings of challenge players but you look at like uh who should play again etc cetera, etc cetera. you have scally usually guess the percentages and so i thought it'd be basically in the same neighborhood to do what we sometimes do and do a little bit of a survey ourselves so what I did was over the past couple days, I surveyed the members of the Survivor fan community 
with a series of horror movie villains. Ooh. And I asked them to go amongst this list that we'll get into and pick which Survivor 47 contestant, past or present, do they think most matches up, that most reminds them of that. So the way this is going to work is that I'm going to provide a horror movie villain. You are each going to provide an answer of a contestant. They will be different, and we'll go back and forth with who goes first. And basically, it's sort of family feud style where the percentage of the votes that person got, that's the number of points you get. Ooh. So if you got one that's 13%, you get 13 points. And so that's going to add up over all of these questions, and the person with the most points at the end wins. Well, it's a good thing Scally's not competitive. <laughs> I thought about this for a long time. <laughs> yes. And that's the thing as well is that we want reasonings from the two of you too. And it's also very interesting because it's going back to the classic uh, touchy subjects challenge as well, right? Which Ooh. is, okay, how do you weigh what you think the answer is versus what you think the majority said? That's fair. Um, and I told you this already, Mike, there's a lot of characters here that I'm not super familiar with, but luckily it ended up being the majority that I do know. Um, so I do feel like I'm at a disadvantage going into this. Uh, but the ones, that, the ones that I do know, the ones that are, you know, more, how do you not know, you know, a Dracula, a Frankenstein? Um, I'm very curious to see what the audience had to say. Well, that's the thing as well is it could be a bit of an advantage for yourself too. You Ooh. could be the wounded snake here where Scowling might come in with a premeditated opinion about who he would pick for a character that you don't know. You are coming in with a much more neutral perspective. That's true. We'll All right. See. Well, let's start with the first one. And yeah, we started with some of the classic villains to Matt's point. Start off with some, some easier ones here, at least from a memorability perspective, maybe not for a contestant. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Dracula? So Matt, let's start with you. Give your answer and why you think that person would be the answer. So what I would say for Dracula, based on like, what do, you know, what do people know about Dracula? He wants to suck your blood. Um, now, who was on Survivor bleeding, in air quotes, uh, very recently? Sue. She wasn't actually bleeding, very luckily. She was perceived to be bleeding due to the paint. Um, so I went along that line of thinking and I said, hmm, who wants to suck Sue's blood, metaphorically speaking? Um, and I said that that was Gabe, who really wants to work with Sue. Um, oh, so, so it's a compliment to suck someone's blood. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, so that's where I went. And that's who I would have answered. I would have said that Gabe is Dracula. You really had me going in one direction and just completely <laughs> diverted it. <laughs> All right, Scally, huh. what do you think? I'm so torn between two people. I thought Ligori was going with one of my options in Sue, also because she stopped aging at 45, uh, which <laughs> Dracula does not age. Um, so I thought about that, but I don't know if the audience is going to think the same way, but I'm looking at the person on the cast who uh, both won the bat immunity necklace and has a bat tattoo on his body, uh, which Dracula does transform into. So I'm looking at a Kyle. Honestly. Looking at Kyle. Okay. Uh, so let's get into it. Scally, you had a very creative perspective. The aesthetics were screaming Kyle for bat. Fortunately, the audience was not. 4.2% said Kyle. Yep. <laughs> I was thinking Matt, him too. Matt, you Dracula. got the second place answer, which was Gabe with 17.9% of the votes. So that rounds up to 18. Uh, the top answer by just a hair with 22.1% of the vote, Sam. Mm. I mean, looking at this picture of Dracula, I can see it. Yeah. yeah it, it also might be like he has a little bit of that Edward Cullen look to him of like that that ageless handsomeness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm casting. I know I know a lot of people who think Sam's handsome. Um so we'll go with that. And Sam. <laughs> that and Sam, JD. Exactly. <laughs> uh, for me? Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Sam's very handsome. <laughs> Are you like Sue with the with the paint? Like, oh, I wonder who thinks that way. <laughs> <laughs> no All way. right. So a little bit of a lead right now, but again, these questions go back and forth. So anything can truly happen. Let's go to our next question here. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most? of Frankenstein's monster. Yes, for all you pedantic people out there, the monster, 
The doctor was named Frankenstein, not the monster. So we're talking about old bolthead himself, Scally. Who do you got? Okay. Now, this is one that I was thinking a little bit more aesthetically. So now I'm wondering if uh, me and the audience might be a little more aligned. I'm thinking someone who seems, you know, not to be the biggest talker out there, but seems like a big presence. I'm going Saul. Saul. Okay. Saul for Scally. Matt, who do you got? So I was thinking in terms of the storyline still and thinking that if, you know, if the monster was created by, uh, by Dr. Frankenstein to, you know, do whatever the monster was supposed to do out there. I was thinking that uh, Sam is Dr. Frankenstein and the monster is Andy. Okay. Uh, well, we all know the monster is Jelinski. We saw that last season. But <laughs> Matt says Andy. And Matt, I can confirm Andy commandingly was the number one answer. 33.7% of the vote. I think a lot of people went along with your methodology. And also like uh, the whole George Costanza thing about him being clumsy. As we know, Frankenstein, not the most dexterous person. Uh, Scally, you had said uh, Saul. Saul was the number two. And 17.9% uh. of the vote. Damn. So about <laughs> half of what Matt ended up getting. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, third, place, third place was Kyle. I think maybe oh. it's just like that, that quieter... Uh, you know, but bigger presence. And then fourth place was Sam. So I think they were going for very much a size thing as well. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, next up, Matt, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of a mummy? <laughs> now, this is funny. The picture of a mummy here is very funny. Um, I think I, again, had to go, I mean, probably uh, same thought process for all of these, just trying to relate to maybe anything that's happened in the game so far. And I'm like, who's trying to cover something up? And that's Sue. Sue had a lot of paint all over the place that, you know, maybe having some extra bandages all around would have helped to hide some of that in some capacity. Um, and, you know, this mummy looks very old, but it's probably at least 45. Um, and we all know Sue is 45. So. All right. Sue, the mummy, the mom on the tribe is a mummy, according to Matt. Scally, what say you? Ooh, I'm going for someone who woke up from a little bit of a two episode slumber at the beginning of the season and now is, you know, running havoc all over this beach. Give me Genevieve. Genevieve for Scally. Okay. Well, Scally, the good news is you did get the number three answer in Genevieve. The bad news is Genevieve yep. got 6.5% of the vote. <laughs> yep. As the number one answer was Sue, 35.5% oh <laughs> of the vote. Look it. Liguri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, Mike, I'm supposed to hide the answer sheet, right? I don't know. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, Me overthinking. Shocking. Second place, 10.8% of the vote. You want to guess who it is? Second Ooh. place for the mummy. Hmm. Caroline? Like Liguri is, yeah. <laughs> Caroline, Scal, you have a guess? Uh, Annika. <laughs> John, John Lovett. Oh, okay. Not a clue. Not a clue. No, this is why. where I kind of wish I had attached, like, uh, please explain your reasoning why. Yep. Oh, and I forgot half my other reason. Mummy, mother, like Sue, mother. That's my, uh, yeah. You know. oh, yeah. See, mummy, mother, mother, Genevieve. <laughs> yeah, as well. uh, John Lovett, perhaps also a mother in his own right, got 11% of the vote. Okay. Okay. I almost feel like did Kyle score like top five for every single one of these? No, Kyle was actually pretty low for this one. He got four percent of the vote. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next up, which Survivor forty seven contestant Scally reminds you the most of a veil wolf? Okay. Uh, I was trying to come up with someone who had an iconic nighttime sequence on the show, and I think someone who um. Sadly, might have uh, devoured Andy a little bit at night early in the season. Uh, I was thinking of Rachel for the werewolf. Rachel for the werewolf. Okay. What about you, Matt? I'm just going based on size here. And uh, Saul's a big guy. I'm going to go with Saul here. Okay. Uh, let's take a look here. Just uh, scrolling down a little bit. Uh, Saul did get 5%. Of Ooh, the vote. Not enough. It is enough because Rachel got zero. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, no, so who's, uh, who's the werewolf no, here? Um, we're going back to the aesthetics here. Gabe, number one answer, twenty three point four percent of the vote. He also had some nighttime stuff as well, right? With him going down to the beach to look Gotta for the idol. Stuff. Second place, Kyle. Uh, I think that's just due to like grooming habits. Twenty point two percent of the vote. Third place, Sam. Fourth place, Andy. So Sam and Andy are. I guess right? the most monstrous Just a bunch people of on the show. Scary men uh, characters <laughs> we've seen so far. I guess they, you know it's translating to those two, unfortunately. All right. Well, let's see if the trend holds, Matt. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of the creature from the Black Lagoon? No, this is the first one where I'm like, I don't know a damn thing about you. Um, so as I oh, look at like a universal ride about the creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't know. I'm a Disney boy. I go to Universal <laughs> sometimes. Um, not often. Um, and yeah, I feel like, you know, when I think of the word lagoon, obviously, you know, water and who was just in the water this week, uh, finding an advantage. I'll probably go uh, give this one to Genevieve. All right. Giving it to Genevieve. Scally, what about you? Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> Okay, so I thought about this one for a minute, and I do believe only one of these people work in uh, an area that some people refer to as a swamp. Um, and so I'm going to go with John Lovett. John Lovett. <laughs> Drain the swamp because there's a fish man there, and his name is John Lovett. Very creative on your part, as was 2.3% of the yep. audience. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Skelly, you're, you're winning the uh, the qualitative war, maybe not uh. the quantitative war. Uh, Genevieve, number one answer, Matt, 15.9% mm. of the vote here. Uh, second was Rome with 12.5%. 12, 12 makes sense. He wanted to be the only one to go into the water. Uh, and third place, Kyle. Again, I think has that sort of like fish-like form to him. Mm. Genevieve being first place with 15% of the vote tells me that everybody got votes. That's insane. <laughs> That's, it's a little bit of a tough one to pin down. To your yeah. point. Asia got one. Asia. A Annika got one. Tini got one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, Scally, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of the Invisible Man? Okay. I did pull up the confessional chart for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, I didn't go for uh, someone that's still in the game. But based on someone who I think was a little less visible uh, than probably anyone still in the game may end up being by the end, I went with Keyshawn. Keyshawn, okay. What say you, Matt? Yeah, definitely, you know, the same line of thought as to who the invisible uh, man would be. And uh, if this was a couple episodes ago, you know, it'd be the invisible woman and Genevieve would have gotten it. Um, I would imagine that maybe people just went all the way back to the person who's been probably the least on the season in some capacity from episode count. And I'll, I'll go John. Love it here. Okay, John, love it. Uh, well, so I think both of you had some very similar logic and you both wound up with, I believe the number three and the number five. Uh, so Matt, John Lovett got 12.5% of the vote and Scally Keyshawn got 7.3% yep. <laughs> of the vote. And listen, I know Survivor fans are a bunch of uh, what have you done for me lately, but the top two responses here, Genevieve, number one wow. at 24% and Caroline, number two at 22%. And see, I was almost thinking that Tiana could be a pick for it because outside of, you know, screaming, excuse me, I feel like we haven't seen enough of her story lately. So I'm hoping there's no. more to come, but Tiana got 1%. That's wow. crazy. Kyle actually was number three at 10.5. Yeah. I'm makes saying sense. Kyle's like, just he had his all little, of them. He had his little peak in the pre-merge with the whole no of it all. And obviously with this last episode, but otherwise, right. yeah, these are probably the three people that had the least amount of like cumulative airtime across the final 13. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, let's move to a little bit more modern stuff, Matt. Let's see if you can uh, maintain your lead here. Which Survivor 47 contestant Reminds you the most of the Baba Duke. Now, um, we're really getting to the portion of this where I will be exposed for not knowing who half of these characters <laughs> remaining are, if not more. Uh, not a clue what a Baba Duke is, but he's got a face that is very excited, very uh, happy to be involved, I would say. Happy to be the star of the show is what I'm getting from Mr. Baba Duke here. And I got to go Rome for that. Okay, Rome, Ooh. Scally, what say you? Okay, so I was initially leaning 
to someone who I know the Babadook is about. They will drive you crazy. And I know that was famously ascribed to TK in the preseason. But I don't know if these pre-mergers are getting a ton of votes here. So uh, I'm going to go to what the Babadook also is known for, which is uh, being a gay icon. Oh. Um, and so I'm going to go for Genevieve. Okay, for Genevieve. Uh, Genevieve, 2.2% of the vote. Yep. <laughs> well, it, we should say that you were on the money. I think that it's less so about gay icons and more so icons who are gay. Sure. Uh, because John Lovett got 8.8% of the vote. There we Andy, go. Andy, 8.8% of the vote. Teeny, 13.2% of the vote. But the number one answer, Matt Ligori is Rome, 22% of the vote. I mean, look at that face. That guy's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty animated. Yeah, it's very true. I don't know. I, I thought that people would go purely for the aesthetic that Scally was talking about. But again, maybe it's a bit of a look thing. Maybe it's the fact yeah. that like he did sort of like bother this this poor mother and son to the point of sleeplessness for both of them, driving them to the brink of insanity. And that was what Rome was doing with his <laughs> tribe members by the end. We love the scare, the, the scale of queerness from Rome to Genevieve with actual <laughs> queer people in the middle. <laughs> Listen, there's a reason why it's a rainbow. You know, it's a whole LGBTQ plus. Yeah. Absolutely. Parentheses R for Rome. Uh, all right. <laughs> Next up, Scally, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Chucky? Okay. Uh, I'm Now I'm thinking of two ways. I think I'm going to go with my initial thought. I feel like if anyone on this island has the personality of Chucky, and I know Ligori just guessed him, but I feel like Rome is Chucky. <laughs> like, just an absolute <laughs> menace. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, he was, uh, nobody wanted to play with him at the end of the day, unlike a Chucky doll. Matt, what about you? Most likely to be Chucky. See, I am coming in here thinking about changing my answer to Teeny, uh, but I think I'm not going to do that. I, I think my I just got to go with my gut. And when I saw Chucky <laughs> in the most loving and uh, complimentary way possible, I just said Caroline. <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay, Caroline. Uh, again, Matt coming out of here with like these uh, these pieces of logic. I absolutely love it. It wasn't logic. It was. It was okay, I look, said, look, Caroline did well, get six point three percent of the vote. Okay, something. Uh, Rome got fifteen point six percent of the vote, <laughs> but the number one answer, Matt, you should have gone with teeny? your head. Teeny forty point six percent of the vote. Just a size uh, thing. Chucky's a doll. Teeny oh is teeny. Yeah. Says it in the name. Okay. I that almost went uh... teeny also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Last minute, I, I should have changed. Yeah. All right. Moving on. We've got our uh, Stephen King corner of this survey. Matt, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Pennywise, the clown from It? This is wild. Um, like... <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's a couple things to look at here. Of course, uh, I know, I know the balloon, if if nothing else. And I'm like, <laughs> um, does the balloon have anything to do with any? Can I can I draw a comparison from uh, Pennywise and, and a balloon that is even seen in this picture to anybody on that island? Um, oh my god, this is this is probably the hardest one so far. Um, maybe actually hmm maybe i go in a direction that i was not thinking because i don't have anybody at all right now okay. um so maybe i go back to the sue well uh pun i guess intended um and throw sue's name in the mix because you know we got some stuff going on in the face of pennywise and that just feels like sue oh well, careful what you know what happens when you throw through sue's name out there but all right sue <laughs> for pennywise scally what about you all right. I want for someone who's going to draw you in with a big smile. The Pennywise, apparently a little bit of a shape shifter. Someone who I think presents as a jock, but is also like a musical theater boy and is reading, quote, chick lit. Uh, so I went with Sam. <laughs> okay. Sam was the number three answer at 12.5% of the vote. Sue, 5.2% of the vote. 
Uh, but this one, you know, it's sort of the, the prevailing strategy, perhaps, of the past few. JGR, just guess Rome. Rome, yeah. number oh. one answer, 27.1%. Again, didn't trust vote. my gut. Ah, uh, it's okay. <laughs> and then Gabe, number two, 15.6% of the vote. So I think it's like these uh, two see. chaotic elements, right? The jokesters that are laughing it up behind the scenes, but causing a lot of turmoil for others uh, land as the top two. Uh, Genevieve and Sierra get the same number as Sue Ooh, here as well. Genevieve and Sierra? Wow. I mean, I've been waiting for Sierra to pop up in some way. Maybe the next one, but... We'll see. Let's okay. see which Survivor 47 contestant, Scally, reminds you the most of Carrie. All right. Well, this one I went for who has literally just been, quote, covered in blood on Survivor. And so, uh, you know, wasn't pig's blood, but I'm still going to go with Sue here. All right. That low hanging fruit. Uh, Matt, which non number one answer do you want to pick for Carrie? Because, yes, that was definitely the number one. <laughs> um, it's it's. It's funny because, uh, of course, that's an obvious way to look at it. But like the first thought that I had looking at Carrie's expression as she looks out uh, to everybody looking back at her uh, was Annika, uh, just given the tribal council, given how all that went. And as just her standing there staring back at everybody being like, wow, like, look at me and look at you. Yeah, so that that is some I think that is some sound logic. And I certainly heard some people as they were filling out the survey mention that that I think the kind of like vacant stare and wanting to burn your enemies with fire which is quite literally the climax of carrie does translate to annika annika got 10 percent of the vote oh. sue got 25.8 uh below her genevieve maybe it's Ooh. the idea of like her bathing in her enemy's blood or something <laughs> or like she suddenly awoke much like carrie's uh psychokinetic powers did caroline 14.4%, and you were waiting for Sierra. Sierra, fourth place, 11.3%. Okay. okay. Interesting. I, I definitely had the same... <laughs> I had the same thought with uh, Annika. Uh, that was what I, that's where I would have gone if I if you had picked Sue first. Mm -hmm. All right. Matt, one, two. This answer is coming for you. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Freddy Krueger? I feel like I have two options here, um, and they're pretty common answers that have come up so far. Um, I'm thinking Gabe. I'm thinking Kyle. I'm just not sure which one I'm going to land on. Um, I guess, ultimately, I'll lean Kyle for reasons I can't explain. Okay. The inexplicable okay. answer of Kyle for Matt. Scally, what about you? All right. I'm trying to spread the wealth. And I feel like someone who people can't stop thinking about, they're haunting their dreams. I feel like Tiana is living in people's head rent-free throughout this season. So I went Tiana. All right. Your logic, Tiana, living in a lot of people's heads. Not from an audience perspective. Tiana <laughs> got 2% of the vote. Matt, you guessed Kyle, who got 8.5% of the vote. Number one answer. How many times do I have to keep saying it? Just guess Rome. Rome is number uh. one, 14.9%, but only by a sliver. Sam, second place, 12.8% of okay. the vote. And Gabe, third place with 11.7%. I mean, it does make sense. You know, r the whole en entire conceit of Freddy Krueger was that he was someone that kind of haunted you in your dreams, kept you up at night, a constant tormentor. Again, Rome definitely service seemed like that. I'm I'm not sure about the Sam comparison personally, <laughs> but you do you twelve eight twelve point eight percent of the votes. Do yeah. people also love... think Freddy Krueger is handsome? Is that what's happening? Uh, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. I suppose. <laughs> I, I love so. the people that just opened this up and checked Rome for every answer and hit submit. I, <laughs> I think that, I think a lot of people did that. There's a non-zero <laughs> chance, yeah, that some people had told me like, oh, there was so many to put Rome down for. Uh, so I don't know, maybe Sam. He has a little bit of like a Wolverine look going on on the island, and Freddy Krueger does have an infamous set of claws that he uses to exact his kills. I'm trying to assign logic yeah. here to essentially a logicless survey, but <laughs> there we go. So next up, Scally, we talked about Freddy. It only makes sense that we talk about the other side of that ambitious crossover event. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th franchise? Okay. Now, when I was trying to go here and ascribe each character or one person from the season to each character, 
I ended up putting Caroline here, like quiet, but kind of unstoppable. A lot of people are starting to look at her as a viable winner. I ultimately don't know that the fans are go on coming out in the droves to say caroline should be the next jason um so i'm gonna go with a safer pick and let's pick sam sam okay <laughs> i love these swerves that you guys are doing keeping me on my toes all right matt what about you you know i think i'm learning something and i think i'm also going to go with the safer pick and just pick rome okay you picked rome Gotcha! That's the one time you should have picked Rome. Uh, a classic <laughs> switcheroo uh, Halloween I got style. There we go. Rome got 2.1% of the vote. Because here's the thing about Jason Voorhees. He don't talk. He don't say uh, anything. He just wears a mask me. and uh, skulks his kills. So yeah, Rome is quite the opposite. Scally, you went with the traditional pick in Sam. Sam did finish in second place, 12.8% of the vote. Okay. Number one winner, 26.6% of the vote, Saul. Mm, what do you think doesn't make pick. sense? Saul is like a little more, uh, compared to like the fervor that Freddy Krueger has, Jason's a little bit more methodical, a little calmer. Saul talks about all the times he had to meditate out there because of Rome's presence around him. So it does make sense that the way he kind of just walks through life is a, very Jason Voorhees way. I don't know if that's an insult at all. Okay. I can see it. I definitely see it. All yes, right. Sam, you know, good for second place, but I think that a high confessional count might be hurting him. <laughs> all right. Moving on here. Now we're, uh, we're flashing to some more uh, modern day quote unquote villains here. Matt, I'm intrigued to see if you get this reference, which survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of Samara from the ring. I feel like anytime I've heard of the girl from the ring, I've never heard a name attached to it. So, you know, again, learning things today. That's great. Um, I am going to go with somebody here who has not come up yet. I don't think in an actual answered way. So now I'm trying to be strategic about like, we're at the bottom of the form. Who are we looking at that hasn't been picked yet? And I'm going to go with someone Scally did guess earlier and say, Rachel, Rachel. Okay. What about you, Scally? Okay, see, now I have seen the ring. I feel like someone who seven days later is staring at you from the TV screen and almost is imposing on you with standing there silently in front of you. I went with Annika this time. Okay, you guys got the number one and two answer. You absolutely Ooh. killed it here. The Gata girls end up finishing first <laughs> and second. Unfortunately, Scally, Rachel was the number one answer, 31.6% of the vote to Annika's 22.1% of the vote. Not sure why. Maybe it's honestly because Rachel has paler skin and yeah. Samara is a girl who lived in a well uh, or was thrown down there and haunted it. Number three, Genevieve. And oh, number okay. four, Caroline. Number five, Asia. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess if we were looking for thrown in a well, we could have gone with Rome. Yeah, um, yeah this is, I, I honestly <laughs> thought that Rome would be a much bigger share, but no, he ends up getting 2% once more. I think they really went for like matching genders with this one because to your point, Samara, Matt is known as the girl from the ring first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. <laughs> so <laughs> if it's gotten to me, there we go. All right. Scally, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of the Predator? Okay. Now for the Predator, I went with someone that I feel like it's taking a lot of glee in hunting for sport here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone who has famously talked a couple times now about how much they love blindsiding people. And I went with Andy for the Predator. Andy. Okay. As the Predator himself. Matt, what about you? Hmm. This guy looks strong. Um, looks like he could, you know, uh, really tackle a uh first journey of the season and push asia out of the way to make sure he gets uh what he needs out of that opening challenge there so i think i'll go tk see if all right him some love matt saying gone but not forgotten in the form of tk and it was the right one to go for here as you land a knockout punch a tko 37.6 percent of the vote is tk i mean also uh to be Candid, I've seen the Predator comparison a bit with Russell Swan as well. I think like guys with braids, uh, the mm. Predator sort of has that look to him. So TK, yeah, ends up being the resounding number one here. Number two is Saul. I think it's that idea again of sort of being like a uh, in the background Predator. Uh, unfortunately, Scally Andy, 3.2% of the vote. 
okay well <laughs> they just don't see the vision <laughs> yeah exactly uh game game number three with 11 percent uh which also makes sense because he's doing things behind the scenes all right okay. final few here and uh Let's it all be candid without giving away the numbers. It's not exactly competitive. It's garbage time, as we like to talk about in uh, football <laughs> terms. But we'll throw some points here. So next up, Matt, which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of the Xenomorph, the main antagonist from the Alien franchise? You know, I'm really starting to get to the point of wanting to beg you guys for clues about like what these people do and where they, you know, anything about them. Because especially this picture, I'm just like, I'm not getting, I'm not, I'm not sure what you do. I'm not sure who you are. I'm not sure your intentions, your motivations. I see some sharp edges, uh, you know, some, po some pokey. They're snatched. Yeah. Um, so like, who's pokey? Uh, <laughs> who's, who's sharp? Who's really sharp out there okay. I, i'd be afraid to get near um uh, that's not the reasoning here but i, I haven't really gotten a uh, a good one in for tiana yet so i, I have no idea tiana All right. according to matt lagori tiana the most pokey out of i mean look she's really point. not she says excuse me she's so polite but i don't know all right scally what about you Okay, I went for someone who I feel like the Xenomorph is like acting on instinct, you know, and trying to go with their gut. And I went Sierra here, but I don't know how that's going to go. Scally, you did get the number two answer uh, with Sierra. Not a clue why. I think you described <laughs> probably a better logic behind it than a lot of people who did this. This was far and away the most evenly split oh. answer ever. Uh, so everyone pretty much got like a little bit of a slice of the pie. Number one was Genevieve with 10.1%. Tiana did get 6.7% okay, as okay. well. So again, uh, it's tough. You know, I think the alien queen is a mother and is mother. So again, maybe that's why Genevieve is the number one answer. Also like, again, kind of like skulking around behind the scenes, making her kills, uh, so that no one sees it coming. Next okay. up. Uh, I don't want to ask Matt what his favorite scary movie is, but this guy certainly does. Matt, uh, no, I think it's Scally this time. Yeah. Which Survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most of the ghost face killer from Scream? Oh, see, I thought that the amulet trio of Andy, Teeny, and Caroline would be such a fun reveal as a ghost face yeah. at the end of the movie. Especially uh, if, like, uh, Teeny votes out Andy and is like, yeah. ah, see? <laughs> so Just catch I thought... up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Scream franchise definitely uh, could use, you know, uh, I don't know, bring them in. But I was looking at someone who most of the movie, you're like rooting for this person and they seem so nice and they're just another character who you don't necessarily need to be worried about. But ultimately, they're a killer and you didn't know it. And that's why I went Asia. Asia. Okay. Asia as Ghostface here. Maybe a late Halloween costume idea for her. Matt, what say you? I can't say Asia too. That was my answer. Oh. Uh, that was the one I I'm... felt the most confident about in the whole damn board. Really? What was your logic behind it? <laughs> well, when you take off the ghost face mask, you never expect, or you, you know, in theory, never expect who's under it. And like that's like the whole thing. That's why all of us, you know, went into the season so excited, not just because no asia uh because i you know it really seemed like she could be somebody that takes off the mask later in the game and's like hey, got all of you um so you know with that robbery aside uh both in this game and in that game um my second pick would have to be sierra sierra okay sierra did get seven percent of the vote asia did get and again maybe it's, your logic maybe it's not 8.2 percent oh, oh. this is another pretty evenly split one number one is andy with 13.3 oh uh, you know that makes sense, makes a lot of sense see, yeah. by like oh it's he that character so that was fun. there that was there the whole time you didn't realize that he was actually the killer uh number two was tiana as well Ooh. okay yeah no i should have we should have thought andy because he's just you know like oh that was so much fun to blindside and get the kill in and, <laughs> um he said it like twice in the episode so yeah well, once privately and once publicly as well yeah <laughs> all right uh, last but not least i've asked you guys uh before you came onto the podcast if you wanted to play a game and this guy likes to ask that question as well so believe us back to matt here which survivor 47 contestant reminds you the most 
of Jigsaw from the Saw franchise? I think um, I would be remiss to not use the final opportunity here to, you know, one more time, just guess room. Okay, JGR at its finest. Scally, what do you say? Okay, now I feel like, you know, who on this cast is most going to uh, almost like in a sick way enjoy making people play games for their lives and just like really wants to stir up chaos uh, and toy with people. And I feel like that's Gabe. All right, Gabe was the number one answer with 16% of the vote. And Rome was number two as well with 10.6% of the vote. Uh, number three, Keyshawn with nine points. Oh, Keyshawn really? was pretty good as well, right? Like he was the guy that wanted to live in chaos and wanted to live in disorder and stir shit up as well, uh, but was also tied with Teeny and Sue. Uh, Teeny, I guess because Jigsaw is represented usually in the form of like that little doll. So I guess TD <laughs> was sort of the, bl the, the blanket answer there. That's going to do it for the survey. Uh, so the good news, Scally, is you ended on a high note. You got the number Look. one answer. And um, it was double or nothing, right? Oh, uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, though you would have like barely won if it was double or nothing because the final <laughs> score was Scally with 167, Matt with 285. Whoa. Yeah. How you know. that happened? I mean, you, you, you netted a couple of those really big ones. Sue is the Mummy uh, was a big example of that. I think Scally was going for some more out-of-the-box picks that en ended up netting like 2% every time. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, Scally beats me in a lot of competitions we have on the podcast, so I will gladly take this one. You know, I'm actually looking at our draft because um, we, we drafted these players before the season as well. And, uh, you know, not to jinx myself, uh, but I, I do feel decent about the team that I have left. So I'm hoping that, you know, between this, uh, it gives me momentum into our draft too. Not to cross the streams too much, but what are the teams currently at this moment with Ooh. six people booted? Scally remaining has uh, Tiana, Kyle, Rachel, Sam, Genevieve, and Sierra. Um, and then I have Andy, Teeny, Gabe, Saul, Caroline, and Sue. Okay. So yeah, it feels pretty even, to it be feels honest. pretty but... even, yeah. I mean, I think not to, like, do too much edit rating or anything, but, like, trying to figure out who are the possible winner candidates at this point. I mean, it's the new era, so things are definitely more thrown into disarray. But I think from an editing perspective, like, you both have pretty balance between some of the biggest characters in the moment. Yeah, I mean, look, for BB26, he had the entire Final Four, so I'm already feeling better. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere to go but up. Uh, yeah. All right, last but certainly not least, as we do every week here on the BNB, I throw it over to our guests to uh, give a charity or cause that they would want to highlight this week for the listeners. And once again, in the spirit of being charitable for charity, you are each going to give one. So, Scally, let's start with you. What do you want to highlight? Um, I'll go with uh, Room to Grow. It is, I, I don't know if it's New York City based, but they definitely have a New York City operation in which they help with expand, uh, expected parents who uh, need a little bit of help in, uh, you know, getting stuff ready to have a child. So Room to Grow. All right. And Matt, what about you? Um, this house regularly makes uh, some donations to the Trevor Project, uh, you know, a well-known in name out there, um, you know, providing support for LGBTQIA plus individuals in all aspects. And, you know, we were talking about a lot of gay icons here today. So, you know, it's pretty fitting. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, if I may uh, go vote, uh, pretty important week to uh, make sure you're doing that. Get those early votes in. Make sure you talk to the people around you and make sure they have their voting plan. I think we all know it's a thing, but you know, it's really, it's one thing to know that you got to do it and one thing to get out there and go do it. So make sure you're doing that. Yes, very valid. Don't be a no vote Kyle here. Make no. sure your voice <laughs> is heard. This was such a pleasure, guys. Uh, you filled in for Liana, astoundingly so, went above and beyond you answered a bunch of nonsensical questions on the survey, provided your uh, your insights into the season so far. This was a lot of fun. And of course, if people don't want to miss out on the dynamic between you two guys, you have plenty going on, not only on free agents, but really across uh, not only podcasts, but other forms of the internet as well. Scally, what would you like to plug for the listeners out there? Ooh, well, people should go check out the Free Agents podcast talking about the challenge season 40 and House of Villains season two. And then outside of that, anything I'm doing is on Twitter at Brian underscore Scally on Twitch at twitch.tv slash B Scally talking about the Traders Canada, which has been a super, super fun season uh, over on We Know the Traders. So uh, check all that out. And Matt, what would you like to plug? 
Yeah, in addition to the Free Agents podcast, again, come check us out. Uh, we have a lot of fun talking all things reality TV, uh, mostly the challenge, but everything. Um, check out the Dancing with the Stars coverage uh, happening over here on RHEP on the We Know Reality TV feed. Mike was with me a couple of weeks ago, um, and we've been having you know a lot of fun along the way. Uh, we are going to be joined this week by America Lopez uh, to be talking Ooh. the latest episode. If we want to keep the Halloween theme going, uh, it's Halloween week over on Dancing with the Stars. So come check out all that coverage with myself, Sasha Joseph, and again this week, our, our guest, America Lopez. Uh, last week, we had Amon on to talk Disney night. And speaking of Amon, uh, myself and Amon do a Big Brother-related podcast called The Diary Room, where we are trying to find the best player in Big Brother history by uh, taking years to go through a bracket, six players at a time, and narrow that field down. So check that all out. I'm on Twitter, at Matt Liguori. Um, and Mike, thank you for having us. It was uh, so much fun. Yeah, the pleasure was all mine. And uh, yeah, Matt, nothing on Tuesday will scare me more than Alan as that donkey in last week's episode. Yeah, Absolute he, nightmare fuel. He got, ahead of, uh, he got ahead of himself with the costumes. <laughs> which you can check out in all its nightmare fuel glory at a Mike Bloom type on social media, which is where I am everywhere, including on my cameo. As for stuff I'm doing, of course, I got the chance to talk with Rome, which was very fun. Rome, again, certainly did not mince words when it came to his thoughts on everything that happened, including Kyle, uh, all the chaos going on on Lavo, including him revealing that apparently that Keyshawn Tribal Council like went live at a certain point where like Rome just starts pulling people aside and whispering to them to make sure that he should steal Keyshawn's vote and vote out Keyshawn. Uh, and also obviously also responding to the edit and other players' perceptions of him. I thought it was a really great conversation to so check all of that. Out. I'm also doing exit press for the challenge uh, for uh, the mass singer as well on occasion. And then over on the uh, scripted TV side of things, I'm finally on my BSGBS continuing Battlestar Galactica with Josh Wiggler on up down the hatch. I'm covering the penguin. It's great leader. I am doing uh, we did TV for real with Sasha Joseph and Jay Maya, which was really great conversation. So if you're into scripted TV and you're into Survivor 45, check all of that out or just stay here for the B and B next week. Liana will be back. We'll be bringing on a guest once more to talk about whatever's going on next week. Uh, not to say too much, but press releases are teasing that we may not be out of the woods just yet with like a uh, nice clean post merge. So we shall see what's coming again. Just like a scary movie, right? You thought that the killer was done, but the monster <laughs> is always hungry, but no matter what, we'll be back for another serving next week of the B and B. Thank you all so much for listening. Send us game ideas, uh, rhapbnb at gmail.com or hashtag rhapbnb on social media. Special thanks to everyone who filled out this survey as well. Whatever logic you wanted to use, whether it was like a Rome down ballot initiative or really picking and choosing, it was very much appreciated. Also, special thanks to the entire RHAP team behind the scenes for packaging all this up for your listening and viewing pleasure and to Will from America for his fantastic theme song. We'll be back next week covering week several of Survivor 40 Several. Until next time, everybody, we'll check you out at your next day.